are having a good morning on this Monday morning. And thank you so much for joining us for the webinar today. Uh, my name is Nicole Wolf, and I'm the Branch Manager of Library Development here at the Kentucky Department for Libraries and Archives. And this morning's webinar is called Introduction to the Kentucky Workforce Innovation Board. Uh, we're very grateful to have uh, Melissa Aguilar here with us this morning. She is the Executive Director of the uh, Kentucky Workforce Innovation Board, or KWIB, and she's going to give us an overview of that board. And so um, at the end of the presentation, hopefully you'll have a better idea of how public libraries sort of fit into the statewide overarching uh, workforce network. Um, if you have any questions or need technical assistance during the webinar, myself and Lauren Abner, who is KDLA's technology consultant, we will be monitoring the chat box. So feel free to type in any questions or issues as we go along. And you'll notice in the bottom left-hand corner right now, if you click on KWIB Overview, that is the slide deck that you can download. It is a PowerPoint file. And at the end of the webinar, that will pop up again for you to download. As I said, this webinar is being recorded, and it will be available on our archive webinars page in about a week. And so again, good morning, and we're very excited about the webinar today. And I will go ahead and bring up Melissa's slides and kick it over to Melissa, who can give a further introduction and get us started. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. I, I've really enjoyed um, being able to give these presentations to everybody. And, and actually, I've had multiple follow-up questions from so many people just by email. So um, it's, it's been enlightening, number one, to get the feedback from everyone around the state. And then secondly, um, there have been some really great points of discussion um, and, and changes, actually, um, that has been suggested by the Library Network. So again, thank you, and please don't hesitate to always reach out to me if there's extra information that you need or questions that you have. Um, so let's get started uh, with this piece. Um, so the Kentucky Workforce Innovation Board is mandated by a federal law called the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act, which is WIOA for short. Um, and um, for the federal law, basically it looks at um, aligning education, workforce, and economic development, um, and then certainly making sure that we have support systems in place to support employers who are seeking job seekers and job seekers who are seeking employers. So we go both ways. Um, education is also thrown right into the middle of that, as well as economic development. Um, so what you basically um, see here on the slide is we, the WIOA overview, and, and certainly I'm not going to go through every single one of these, but it's really to establish a one-stop system that can refer and take in customers um, every day and be able to help them get training, education, or employment. Um, the Kentucky Career Center, if you haven't visited one, which most of them are closed right now for COVID, um, but certainly when we start back up, if you haven't visited a Kentucky Career Center, um, we would certainly ask that you do so. And if you want a specific tour of the Kentucky Career Center, certainly we would love to have you. We'll set you up with that if you just want to give me an email. I'll be glad to get you in touch with um, where, whatever region that you have. But the Kentucky Career Center serves as that one-stop system for referrals. So it can be as simple as somebody walking in the door and saying, hey, I'm here as an employer, and I would like to find 10 employees um, within the next month. Um, you know, We certainly would help the employers with that type of um, scenario. But then it can also be as easy as a person walking in and saying, hey, I don't have my high school diploma. Um, I'd really like to get a GED. Where can I do that? So there's multiple resources on both fronts for each customer, and we'll go through some of those here in just a moment. So let me just explain a little bit about the landscape of how we get to the point that we have a Kentucky Workforce Innovation Board. So of course, the governor designates the members of the Kentucky Workforce Innovation Board, and we are the strategic planners, so to speak. So we our responsibility 
um, is to set the vision for a holistic workforce system. And in 2018, we actually did so with the Kentucky Work Ready Strategic Plan, um, which we also have now uh, now have approved through Governor Bashir. Um, the most important piece of the puzzle is the fact that we have local workforce development boards. Um, there's 10 of them across the state. Um, they are the ones that actually align and operationalize the strategic plan. And they also have a local strategic plan of their own, but we always make sure that their local strategic plan is also in alignment with our state strategic plan. But then if there are specific changes that's made, we want to make sure we support the local boards in doing so as well. And new to us, um, by, by way of executive order from Governor Bashir in July, we now have a Kentucky Works Collaborative. And they are the group that implements the strategic plan across the board. And libraries is a part of that through the Education and Workforce Cabinet. So we'll talk a little bit through that in just a, a few moments. All right, let's talk about the plan itself. So. Um, in 2018, we went out to about 600 and some people across Kentucky and asked them, you know, what's important to you from a workforce perspective, from an education perspective, and from an economic development perspective. Um, those groups came from employers, they came from job seekers, they came from partners of the system. Um, the libraries were also at the table. So these are the things that, that, that everyone said holistically we need to do more of. So one is to increase employer engagement. So we have a supply and demand system. The demand is created by the employers. The supply is created by the workforce system. Um, so certainly the, the employers drive the bus in this case. Um, because if we don't have the jobs and we don't know what the jobs are, we don't quite understand what the supply is. So that was number one. Secondly, from an educational attainment and completion um, position, um, we have actually not as high of an educational attainment and completion level as what states do around us. So this is one of the, the key factors in us thinking about how to promote workforce participation and get um, employees who understand what the qualifications are and they are qualified for the job. So we work a lot with the secondary school system and the post-secondary system as well as the proprietary educators. Um, to, to make sure that we have that supply ready for the demand. The third piece is the workforce participation rate. Um, at the time that we did the um, strategic plan, we were actually 45th at that point. Um, we now are 42nd, so we've hopped up a couple of places. However, that is pre-COVID. It's not post-COVID. So I think we probably have changed at this point. At the, at the point of this presentation, we were 43rd, so we've, again, hopped up one place. But we really want to make sure that we're looking at all populations that's included in the workforce. So the you know, special populations like the ex-offenders, individuals who are on state assistance, individuals who are disabled, et cetera, we want to make sure that they're included in this workforce participation rate. And then last but not least, at one point there was a study pre the strategic plan that said that we had about a billion dollars um, in, in money that's coming from the federal and state levels. And that billion dollars we really were questioning at that time. So we are looking at a resource map that shows federal and state dollars coming in so that we are able to really have a good idea on how much money um, makes up the, the entire system. But then additionally, we want to look at specific populations and where money's filtering to those populations. So that gives you an idea of the four goals. Um, we specifically had uh, a timeline, and, I, and I'll say again, you'll probably hear me say this a lot throughout the conversation. Um, we had goals lined up for, or objectives lined up for each goal. And so therefore, what you're seeing on, on the uh, screen now is a timeline for those objectives. Um, and if you do go to the link that Lauren put in the uh, chat room, um, if you go to page 12, that's a really good uh, summary of what the plan is about and what our goals and objectives are. So here's the current landscape. Um, we have the Kentucky Workforce Innovation Board. Um, just a reminder that that board is driven by employers because we must have 51% business representation. We also have a 20% workforce populations representation, which means that individuals with disabilities, 
um, foster youth, et cetera, the special populations that we work with, we want to make sure that they're well represented on the board as well. Um, and we are administratively attached to the Education Workforce Development Cabinet, just as libraries are. Um, then we have an executive committee. Um, and per the strategic plan, we now have four additional committees, which is workforce participation, resource alignment, employer engagement, and education completion and attainment. And those specifically line up with the four goals. Additionally, we have five other committees that we work with. Um, if you aren't familiar with the Work Ready Communities um, uh, certification, we have that for local counties, so therefore we get applications in to, to work with counties on becoming work ready or maintaining their work ready status. We also have other committees that look at career pathways, career tech education, um, specifically military and veterans task force, which works with transitioning military for our two bases specifically. Um, and then we have an opportunity youth subcommittee. So let's just talk a little bit about the collaborative, because that's, a, again, a very important piece that came from an executive order from the governor's office. The collaborative itself has four specific committees, and these are directed toward the directive that's in the executive order, uh, metrics, funding, sustainability, and a memorandum of agreement. Um, and now what we have done is actually to, to merge a few of these committees because of the overlap in what they were trying to do. So funding and resource alignment now is a committee that's working together. So it, ultimately what you end up having is you'll have state entities, state cabinets, and representation from those cabinets working specifically with business people on those specific topics. And it's really worked out well because it, it's, it's given us a lot of insight um, and it's given the state cabinets a lot of insight as to how employers think about these things from an employer standpoint. And that's really, really important um, for the employers to drive the bus, as I mentioned earlier. These are the collaborative members. Um, so we have 19 different entities. So you will see, you know, the labor cabinet, you'll see health and family services, justice and public safety, uh, CPE, Council on Post-Secondary Education, but you'll also see the community college system and Job Corps. And again, thinking about how you all are an integral part of this as you match um, to this initiative through number two because you are a part of the Education and Workforce Development Cabinet. These are the nine populations that we specifically designated as the special populations that we want to, to focus on to ensure that if we get individuals out of these populations into the workforce pipeline, um, we will be able to ultimately increase the workforce participation rate. So at any point, um, you all as, as libraries are working with individuals that are here. Um, you are feeding the pipeline, regardless if you are helping them res with a resume, if you're connecting them to some type of resource. Maybe you're helping their children learn, um, which ultimately then still affects the family unit. Um, so we want to make sure, again, that you all understand that how important you are to the overall system. Um, when you are helping customers get, you know, get on the path to sustainability and success, you're helping the overall workforce system. So thinking about the collaborative one more time, um, here's the deliverables for in the executive order. So first, um, of the 19 entities that you saw earlier, uh, their main responsibility is to help implement the Work Ready Strategic Plan, thinking about those four goals um, that we talked about earlier. Secondly, I talked a bit about the resource funding map, um, and that's the billion dollars that was in question as to how much money actually comes in. And we now have a pretty good draft of that that we're going to um, work on and unveil on September the 17th for the first collaborative meeting. Number three is self-sustainability and benefit cliff analysis. Um, if you were on a call earlier within a couple of months ago, um, we went over the self-sustainability and benefit cliff analysis calculator. I'll bring that up here in just a little bit after the, the full presentation. But this is specifically targeted towards individuals who are getting state assistance, 
they may work a part-time job or maybe that they're looking for a full-time job. And at this point, they're, they're questioning, if I make $14 an hour, how is that going to, to um, alter my benefit that I get from the state? And so there's now a calculator out there that will help them with that, as well as there's a calculator out there for self-sustainability, which means that per county you can look at a calculator and actually figure out how much it is that you need coming in to be able to, to match your expenditures that's going out of your household. Again, we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, last but not least, we'll have a memorandum of agreement among the 19 partners, and this aligns the system in thinking about how we all work together on behalf of the customer. Um, we will also have a draft of this unveiled at the 17th meeting this month. And then last but not least, all of the local, the 10 local boards, will begin now reporting to the, the state board, our, our KWIB. And we will be looking at the system as a whole by each of those local areas. And it also gives a support system for those local areas because if they're having issues with getting partners to work with them in the system, certainly they are now able to come to us. We can go to the collaborative and work those issues out. And this is really just an overview of what it looks like. And the KWIB has a strategic plan, which the local boards implement. The local boards will be working with the collaborative partners to make sure that it's implemented. And those are our 10 local areas, by the way. So data as related to everything that we do. Um, we specifically look at any data that we have through the Kentucky Center for Statistics. Um, and the most important piece is that we look at county data, local area data, regional data, as well as state data. And then we also look at it from a national perspective as well. Um, we want to make sure that when we're looking at data for Kentucky, we are comparing it especially to the states around us because there is a competitive reason that we're doing that. Um, but, you know, all in all, every decision that we make is always, uh, always comes from the data. There's two specific dashboards that we look at, look at every single month, and that's uh, the new local workforce dashboard, which I'll go over later, and the Work Ready Communities dashboard as well. The Work Ready Communities dashboard is a county-level data source. The local workforce dashboard is a regional workforce uh, data source. Um, so when we talk about what makes, what comprises a healthy workforce region, we look at multiple things. We look at the workforce participation rate, we look at job openings, we look at the unemployment rate, we look at the, the hourly wage, um, we also look at the specific partners that make up the system and where they fall in the mix. Laura, can you hear me for some reason? I have uh, been booted off the system. Yeah, it says connection loss, um, okay. so I'm rebooting it. Okay. <laughs> so hang on. Okay. Um, see if that works. I'm able to click through. Or is everyone seeing it? Seeing the screen? Yeah. Can everyone hear? Okay. Okay, good. So we'll continue to move forward with the right, next screen. You. Yeah, so again, thinking about a regional system, um, we look at things like how many credentials was, po was, uh, was uh, obtained in a regional system, both by secondary and post-secondary. We look at apprenticeship. We look at employers who are, who are receiving training assistance in some way, shape, or form. So again, just thinking about what comprises a healthy workforce system in a region. Um, this is something that we really look at very closely is UI duration. Um, specifically now that we are in COVID time, we have a lot of dashboards that, that really give us data on how long are people staying on unemployment and how many individuals actually exhaust the entire amount of 26 weeks that they currently have. Um, and, of course, now we're getting into post-pandemic employment. Um, so, therefore, we're going to have a new dashboard on that as well. 
Um, adult education is also very important because of the fact that um, you know we have a, a pretty large percentage of adults without a GED. Um, you know, anywhere between 35 and 60 is somewhere the average age for that. Um, so we've been really focusing on trying to get adults into the classroom, get their GED, or even if they have their GED, how do we help them with skills upgrade to get to a point that they are sustainable and qualified for position. And then we break this down by all local areas so that our local areas also understand where they fall in the mix. So if we have a best practice, for example, in eastern Kentucky, um, and we look at you know workforce participation rates, and all of a sudden workforce participation rates has shot up in one area, then we'll go to that area and actually ask, what are you doing? You know, we're seeing this gigantic step forward in progress. Please share whatever you're doing so that we can give that to the other local areas. So moving on to the next dashboard we have um, is work ready communities. And again, this is at a county level. Um, when you look at this map, you'll see the dark blue areas. That means that they are at a point that they are work ready. So they've met certain certifications to get to that point. The light blue areas are, uh, it explains that they are work ready in progress, which means they have a plan in place, they have all their partners coming to the table, and they are working on, uh, on getting the, the criteria achieved. The orange areas are those who may or may not be working on it to some degree. They've said that they are working on it, but we haven't seen the solid evidence. And then the white or gray areas, as you see on your screen, those are the ones um, that have not even intended on working on a full plan. However, let me also say that, for example, you'll see Fayette and Jefferson County in the mix of not being work ready and not giving us a letter of intent to be work ready. What's interesting is the question is, do they really need to do so? Because businesses are, are going there um, you know, very on a re very regular basis. However, they also are working on these things behind the scenes, so they may or may not have be participating in the, the Work Ready Communities program. This is part of the Work Ready Communities dashboard. So when you go to the Work Ready Communities dashboard, you can pull up your own county. Um, you will be able to see specific guidelines on you know, if you have internet availability and access, and, and in all areas at this point, all counties have internet availability and access, um, whether it be through their local library, whether it be through McDonald's, whether it be through the school system, whatever it may be. Um, high school graduation rate, you'll see that for every county. You'll see some college or higher. Um, and the reason this is actually a new piece of criteria because employers were telling us that it's not the fact that they always need four-year or two-year degree people um, coming to them. They at least need something beyond a high school diploma, maybe a welding certification, maybe an EMT certification, et cetera. Um, you'll also see associate degree, and you'll see working age population without a high school diploma. And the counties, as they pull the, the dashboard up, when they see the blue numbers, they know that they are meeting those criteria. However, when they see the red number, they are not meeting that criteria. Another piece that we look at from a county perspective for work ready communities is just demographics basically on their populations. If you look at the, the um, scope there, you'll see that specifically we're looking at the blue area, the red area, and the pink area. And what that means is we're looking at census tracts. The blue areas are the areas that basically meet the criteria. The red area does not meet the criteria. And the pink area is, is in progress. And what happens is when, I, when I'm a local person and I'm looking at my county, so this is Franklin County that we're looking at, I know about exactly where that I can go to really put out the resources because the red area is where there's really small, you know, there's great issues in achieving the criteria. So this is a really helpful 
kind of deep dive into where I should go to work with population. Um, and on this slide, you'll see working age population, vet population, median household income, et cetera. So it gives you demographics on the entire population of the county. This is the criteria. I'm not going to go through this, but this is the criteria that you would meet to get from work ready in progress to being work ready. So here's where uh, this, this is as simple as I can put it. When you look at a workforce region or you look at a county from a workforce perspective, um, these are the entities that you must have at the table to be able to have a holistic um, picture of success. You have to have early childhood education, you must have secondary education, and you must look at the adult population without the high school diploma, which would mean GED. Um, Post-secondary from a proprietary ed to a two-year and a four-year institution must be at the table. And then you must look specifically at all of your essential skills and work ethic habits. Because if you're not offering those essential skills, we currently hear employers complain about this the most, is that individuals will come to us, they'll get a job, however, they don't understand problem solving, they don't have very good communication skills, they may or may not show up for work on time, and we've went as far as to say, you know, they don't understand that they, on break, cannot go out in the parking lot and smoke a joint. And I'm just being really candid with you about what employers tell us all the time. Um, you must look at supply and demand. If, you're, if you've got 1,000 welding positions open and you've only trained 100 welders, you've got a problem. But if you have trained, a, you know, a, a, a thousand welders, but you only have a hundred positions open, you've got another problem. So you really need to look at the fine line between how demand and supply balance themselves out. Um, we have to have work-based learning experiences, whether it be through apprenticeship, whether it be through co-op programs, internship. We have to have that real world experience also tied to textbook world. Um, this is really what we're hearing now also from the employers is that, you know, a person may graduate, but they don't have real experience. Well, we really need to loop those employers in to try to help get those students some real world experience as well through an internship program. Data has to drive every decision that we make. Um, you know, we have a lot of data by, by way of KY stats, but we also have other data systems such as the talent pipeline management system through the chambers currently. And so we're really trying to look at, you know, Bureau of Labor Statistics data and what they're predicting, but also comparing that with real-time data from what we hear from employers every day. Um, these are all issues that we hear employers talk about. Um, you know, absenteeism, safety on the job, quality of the product, productivity and profitability. And so a well-rounded employee has to understand a little bit about everything. Um, training, training and more training. Um, just because you get the job doesn't mean that you are stopping lifelong learning. And so uh, more than ever, we have a lot of employers that are investing in incumbent employees and making sure that the incumbent employees also have the skill set to be promotable as well. Um, you know, we get this a lot, um, especially when we get to work ready communities. Um, we get to the county level, and the judge executive is thinking about their county, the chamber's thinking about their county, the superintendent's thinking about their county but they actually sometimes forget that we live in a very global world. And so um, employers don't care about lines around the county, rounds, lines around the region, or lines around the state. They will go wherever they need to to get successful, qualified employees. And so we really are trying to teach those counties to think globally and not just hone in on only their county, but to really look outside that county because when you look at commuting patterns and where people are traveling to and from work, it will really show you a different picture. <clears throat> the labor force is aging and we have a falling birth rate. So of course that means that uh, the whole dynamic is changing and certainly technology is in play here. 
And then there's this piece. You know, we, we are hearing more and more, especially since COVID has happened, about this gig economy, whereas the new population of workforce, especially from a younger generation, um, you know, they take on jobs for three, six, nine or 12 months or maybe to two years. They know it's going to last for that long, and they're good with it. Um, and then they just move on to the next gig. And, and we are hearing, especially in the more urban areas, we're hearing this more and more. We also are hearing this more and more because of the fact that a lot of people now are getting used to working from home, and they can take on gigs uh, a lot more easily than what they did before. So it's changing the, the whole dynamic of the talent pipeline. And again, thinking about the talent pipeline, you have to go where the people are. And if that's the disability community, if that's the transitioning military and veterans community, whether that's the foster youth community, uh, c c community you have to go where the people are. And we can't stress that enough. So that gives you a little bit of an overview of the workforce system. So uh, Lauren we and Nicole, we probably need to transition over to some looking at some data. OK. And I do got a question real quick while we bring up the uh, slide. Um, you know, in terms of the gig economy, do you think that it's more employee driven or more employer driven or kind of a combination of both? In other words, are people looking for gigs, or are they looking for them um, uh, until they find something more permanent, or do you have any thoughts about that? So we're hearing a little bit of both. Um, first of all, we're hearing employers um, really more and more. We're hearing employers um, gig out jobs, which means that they don't have to hire full-time people. Um, yeah. the, they don't have to pay benefits, for example, and so it's a it's a matter of profitability for the company. They also don't have to worry about finding people who's not who doesn't have those essential skills, right? So um, again, in urban areas, especially, they're doing this more and more, especially since COVID has happened. On the other hand, our younger generations um, they want more of a life work balance. And yeah. the gig jobs usually allow that to happen. And so it, it's a little bit on both ends, but I think as, as it evolutionizes, um, what we will end up seeing is more employers will be looking, the younger generations, you know, will start having children. Children see parents gigging all the time, so that's what they'll think about doing as well. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense, kind of a little of both. OK, uh, well, I've got the screen share. It looks like um, we don't have any questions in the chat right now. But if you guys have any questions, you don't have to wait till the end. Just feel free to type them in the chat, and we'll get to them. And Melissa is going to share some data with us. All right, so I want to make sure, is everyone seeing the Kentucky Center for Statistics website? Yes. OK, good deal. So I want to make sure that you know how to go uh, get data when it's needed as well. So when you get to the Kentucky Center for Statistics website, there's a report screen. So click on the report screen, and it's going to take you to a myriad of different reports. Um, and your eyes can quickly glaze over at this point. Um, so certainly always ask if you have questions um, or if you later get into some of these reports and you have questions, email them to us and we'll be glad to help. So one of the things that I have had talked about is the Kentucky Workforce Dashboard. So what you're seeing is the Kentucky Workforce Dashboard that's getting ready to load. Um, this is updated quarterly. Um, and so our last update was actually in August. Um, so just quickly as to, to kind of demo where you are here, um, when you look at workforce participation rates, again, this is by local area. Um, so for example, if you want to look at workforce participation rate, the lowest or, or the highest workforce, per, oh no, the lowest workforce participation rate is in eastern Kentucky, whereas the highest is in northern Kentucky. And it'll give you percentages there. Um, mean hourly wage, this is always a big surprise to everyone. So when you look at, for example, the Cumberland area, um, they have the lowest median hourly wage at 1788, whereas if you go to Kentucky Anna Works, 
the median wage is 27.83. And I'm, you know, what's interesting about here is normally when you have a really low workforce participation rate, it also means you have a, a mean hourly wage that is less. Well, in this case, it's not. It's actually the Cumberlands that has the lowest hourly wage. Also, what's usually a surprise is I'll ask in our work ready communities meetings, what do you think the median hourly wage is? And everyone normally guesses a lot lower than what it actually is. Um, normally, I'll get people say, oh, 12 to $14 an hour. And it's actually at least 17 or higher. So that's usually always a, a big surprise to everyone. Um, when we talk about specifically UI duration, remember I mentioned earlier that we look a lot at you know, how many weeks indi uh, individuals stay on unemployment. So right now in eastern Kentucky, you have individuals um, staying on unemployment for about 12 weeks, whereas you have the Bluegrass Lexington area staying on for nine weeks. Um, so again, and then these little bars here, which I didn't say before, that's your average. So you know whether you're below the average or above the average from a, a local area standpoint. Um, exhaustion rate, how many individuals um, you know, stay and exhaust all unemployment for 26 weeks. So currently we have Eastern Kentucky. 48, almost 49% of their individuals actually stay on the entire 26 weeks, whereas in the Bowling Green area, you have 33% exhausting unemployment. So again, just thinking about um, you know, the, the health of the economy and, and figuring out you know, across the board how we get individuals into jobs quicker so that they don't, they're on unemployment for a shorter amount of time but also exhaust, not exhausting the unemployment as well. Um, when you move into credentials, for example, uh, credentials where it would be anything from a post-secondary certification to a four-year master's or educational doctorate degree. Um, so right now, Kentuckiana Works, as you see, rate of total credentials is about 2%, but remember they also have a huge population. And then if you look at the TENCO area, um, they actually have uh, a 6.24% rate of credentials, again, smaller population as well. Um, thinking about individuals with training incentives, um, EKSEP, for example, has 37 individuals trained that had some type of employer training incentives. And when I talk about employer training incentives, I'm talking about incentives from either the local workforce board for incumbent employees to get training and upskilled, or through economic development, they actually have incentives to do the same. Um, as, as related to adult education, or GED, Kentucky Skills U outcomes, the percentage with a, without a high school diploma, Eastern Kentucky usually is always the first there. And then Northern Kentucky, again, is, is uh, always at the other end of the spectrum. Um, adults enrolled without a high school diploma, EKSEP, and Green River in the Owensboro area has the highest enrollment here. So let me move up to um, the trends so that you do see that piece. In just a second, so as I mentioned earlier, these are the trends. Um, so for example, the highest trend in workforce participation, remember it was Northern Kentucky. So this will show you how it's trending, you know, from here to here to here. So in Northern Kentucky in 2017, you had a 70% workforce participation rate. In 2018, it dropped to 69 and in 2019, it went back up to 70. So these are the trends that allow those local areas to figure out what I did from year to year to year that may have made a difference, and then to figure out what that best practice is that would actually help it. Here's an interesting one here for adult education. You'll see in 2016 um, how different EKSEP was, and then all of a sudden, in 2017, it increased greatly. And then in 2018, it increased rate drastically. So, you know, we would go to EKSEP and say, wow, between 2016 and 18, what did you do different? Um, and in this case, it was multiple things. They did a, a lot of outreach 
Um, they moved some some adult ed centers into different places. Um, so, you know, those practices really helped increase their adult education rate, for example. Um, so that's that dashboard. Um, I'm not going to go any deeper into that. I want to go to another report unless anyone has questions. Anyone have questions on that? I don't see any questions right now. Okay. So next I want to go to Work Ready Communities because, again, this is a um, a report that really helps you at a county level understand where your county is. So here's Work Ready, count, work ready Communities. Um, I'm just going to go down and pick a county. So right now this is Christian County. Um, again, you'll see that your high school graduation rate, and if you need to see where you need to be, for example, you know, if, you, if you'll just hover over the, the criteria, it will show you. So you should be at 90 percent. Christian County is at 91. Um, some college are higher to be work ready. You should be at 43 percent. Christian County is at 53. Um, for associate degree or higher, it needs to be at 25 to be work ready. Right now, they've got a little bit of work to do. Working age population must be under 15 percent, and they are at 11. And then it'll tell you, of course, information on the, um, the um, essential skills certificates as well as the national career readiness certificates. Those are the essential skills and work ethic skills that, that we talked about earlier as well. It'll tell you what their workforce participation rate is. Um, at the current, they were actually work ready. However, next year they'll have, so if they can't get the 23 back up, they have three years to get to the point that they're back to work ready. Um, and then here's, this is really interesting if, if you want to think about demand and how you're coaching people on what fields they go into. Um, so it will show you a five-year demand specifically for the region. So as you see here, packaging and filling and advanced manufacturing has, is the number one position that they need. In business and IT, they need more customer service representatives than anything, construction laborers, personal care aides, and heavy tractor and trailer truck drivers, so CDL licenses in transport, excuse me, in transportation. <coughs> um, for you to get the additional demographics, you'll go up here to the right and click the county profile. When you get to the county profile, if you remember, here's the census tract. Um, that shows you where where each part of the county is meeting versus not meeting and where the most work needs to be done. So for example, if you are a library and one of these little red communities or one of the pink communities, um, you probably are going to have to reach out a, a whole lot more to get individuals in, or hopefully you've already reached out and you have people coming in. Um, nevertheless, It'll give you the dynamics here on, for example, you have 20% in Christian County living in poverty. Um, the health scores is something that we thought we should add uh, because of the fact that when employers move into an area, they want to know about the health of the area because of the fact that, you know, they look at, um, uh, they look at insurance rates, they look at absenteeism, they look at the health of the community to be able to be productive. Um, so we actually added this health piece here um, for employer's sake. And then there are other reports that you can go to to look at specifically the health of your community as well that breaks it down by the county or local workforce area. So that's a real quick deep dive into Work Ready Communities. Are there any questions on Work Ready Communities before I move on? I don't see any questions in the chat. It surprised me the number that already are workforce-ready communities. Uh, yeah. I didn't realize that number had already. Uh, and I know some libraries have worked on the committees uh, for creating the, the workforce-ready communities. So um, yeah, it's really good to, to know you can go in and see your specific county and, and all of these details. So that's great. It's very helpful, especially for a county. Um, okay, so I want to go over one more report, and this is, or maybe two more if we have time. This is the Kentucky Commuting Patterns Report. Um, remember earlier in the conversation, I talked about the fact that it's very important for you to understand as a county, as a local area, 
as a state that we're working globally. Um, and so this is a very specific breakdown of where people are going county to county um, within Kentucky. So, you know, if we go, we, we were looking at Christian County, I'll just go ahead and pick Christian County again. Um, if we look at Christian County, we'll see that we have 13,000, almost 14,000 people actually come to Christian County to work. So we have more people coming into Christian County than we have people leaving Christian County to go to work. So the yellow pieces up here, the yellow circles, are the counties that people are traveling from to Christian County to work. The blue ones are where people are leaving Christian County to go to work. So of the 8,000, the majority of Christian Countyans are going to Montgomery County, Tennessee out of the state to work. Um, and then you'll see Jefferson County, you have people going from Christian County to Jefferson County, to Hopkins County, to Warren County, et cetera. Um, and then at the bottom of this, you'll see where they're going by industry. So, um, and then you'll also see, you know, by live and work and commuters out and in. So um, more than 1,400 workers are ent entering the county in the goods producing sector. 1,300 is in trade, and then 2,900 is in other. And then for low-wage jobs, this is always interesting too, there's 586 that are entering Christian County for low-wage jobs, 1,590 for middle-wage jobs, and 3,400, almost 3,500 for high-wage jobs. So again, as, as a local economic development person or a workforce person, this tells me a lot about what, where people are traveling and where they are going, as well as how many people are traveling to another county but coming back to spend their dollars in what community. Um, it's really, really important that from an economic development standpoint and a workforce development standpoint um, that employers understand this as well because, again, they don't care where they get the talent, they just need good talent and they need qualifications. So therefore, um, you know, they may not be able to find someone within Christian County because of the fact that Montgomery County, Tennessee may pay more on for goods producing jobs or for manufacturing jobs. So it's important that I as an employer look at where they're going, look at the pay, and then maybe adjust my pay skills relative to, to the qualifications that I need. Does this help just a bit? Any questions on this before I go on? Uh, no questions in the chat. I think this is really interesting. Um, you know, I think for a county it might have implications for their uh, out-of-county library cards because they can see how many people are uh, working in the county that don't live in the county. Uh, so this is really fascinating information. I'm going to do one more um, before I, I start and final, finalize everything. And this is the interactive, and, and this is really what surprises people the most about commuting. So if I were to take, I've been in Christian County, so I'm going to go ahead and go over here to West Kentucky. I'm going to go up here and click West Kentucky, allow it to load, and then it will tell me these lines are that more than 10 people in the community are traveling at least 100 miles from where they live. So you have people going from um, Williamson County to McCracken County. You have individuals going from uh, Rutherford County, Tennessee to Christian County. You see where I'm going with this. However, if I look at the distance greater than 100 miles, what happens here is it really shows me where people are also working as well. So now you're seeing, you know, people travel on this line specifically to Missouri. Um, you'll see people here still traveling to Tennessee. But if I look at numbers less than 10, so let's say that I just want to know where everyone's working, period. Um, if I take this down to one, and I just want to know where they're commuting, this is what happens, is we now see all these people commuting to other states. So it may be the fact that they work for a company 
that's headquartered in Maine, and, and they are commuting from home, and they're working from home. And we have a lot of people here in Alaska. We have individuals here in Hawaii. Maybe that's what my next job will be in Hawaii. Um, so it, it's fascinating from a local standpoint for individuals to understand we are working in a global market, and so therefore you have to think globally. Um, so again, when I go to the county level and I bring this up, everybody's like, wow, you know, our, our kids and the way that they're learning, our kids and thinking that in students K through 12, you know, you can only be a, um, a welder, a doctor, a nurse in my local community. Well, guess what? The, the world is huge, and you can pretty basically have anything that you want as, as long as there's a job out there and you're willing to, to work toward the success of that job. So any questions on the commuting report? We're at 10 till, so I want to make sure I do save a little bit of time in case anyone has questions yes. or thoughts. Um, no questions, but Lauren said, no, Melissa is not allowed to leave Kentucky. <laughs> and I said, <laughs> I said, unless she can work remotely from the beach in Hawaii. <laughs> That's right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> now we're all going to be searching for jobs, right? <laughs> yes. I, I would be happy to work from the beach in Hawaii. Uh, but, you know, and I think COVID's going to play into that. It'll be interesting to see as this goes on if people return to the office or if they keep going remote. Yeah. Um, and how yeah, that, really but, whew. wow. And Melissa, yeah. this is Lauren, and I, I do have a question. You may have intended to do this, but uh, do you mind to show that family resource simulator with the benefits clip? Because that was yeah. pretty interesting in a previous webinar, and there may be some folks in here who didn't see that on a previous webinar, and that's a really great resource to, I, I think, sure. that people don't so know I, about. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm back on reports. So if you scroll down through the many reports there are, you'll come to the Family Resource Simulator. So you click on the Family Resource Simulator. Oops, we have a redirection there. We get to the simulator, so there's two things I want to make sure I point out here. First of all, this is the Family Resource Simulator, but if you're also looking for the basic needs budget, it's here in this paragraph, and I'll, I'll real quickly skim over both. But for the Family Resource Simulator, you know, quickly go, select Kentucky. Again, we'll just stick with Christian County since um, we have been going there. So for Christian, so this is Melissa who has a, a first child which is two years old, a second child who is six years old, and I am the only parent in the neighborhood, or in the neighborhood, in the house. Um, so we'll just go with that. And of course there's lots of other questions, but for the sake of time we won't complete those and we'll just hit the, the go button. Um, we'll say that right now I have a starting wage of seven dollars and a quarter an hour, so I'm at minimum wage. I can complete my savings if I have a car um, and, and what that's worth. If I have specific debt, I can complete that as well. Um, additionally, I look through the specific um, programs that I'm participating in. So let's say I'm participating in everything that's offered to me. And then I look at child care. Um, you know, if I am registering a child with a provider, like a family friend or neighbor, and then this one's the same thing, how much a day that it costs me, if I am I paying for anyone? So we'll just say that no, I'm not paying for anything because my aunt keeps my two kids, for example. Um, click on the go button. Um, we look at health insurance. You know, if you're getting health insurance from the state or if you are indeed working a, a, a minimum wage job, how much the health insurance is, and just click through so that you all can go through this yourself. Um, we look at now, we look at the specific expenses that I have, so for a utilities or um, food plan, transportation, et cetera clicking go again, and then I get to the last part. And this is, again, it's a prototype. Um, we're going to finalize this and have it ready to go for 2021. 
Um, but this helps me see where I have benefit cliffs. So at this point, whenever I got to 30,000, I lost a benefit. Um, then I got to 47,000 or so, I lost another benefit. And then from that point forward, um, I didn't have to worry. So for me being a mother of, of two, um, at, when I get to the point that I'm making 48,000 a year, and if you really want to look at break even, which is about right here from my benefits, I needed to make about 53,000 a year with two children. And then at that point, I would be all the way, you know, I'd be self-sustainable from the point that I need no benefits from the state whatsoever. So again, just making sure that um, everyone understands this is still prototype. We're still taking into account everyone's suggestions. If anyone on the call has suggestions and you want to share those suggestions with us um, or questions that you may have, please let us know because we're trying to get this as, as, as close to possible, as, as close to perfect as possible um, before January 1, which is really the, the green light to put this out there. We'll also have a training and communications plan for this as well. Um, Laura and Nicole, I would ask probably that if you want to do a training pr uh, program on this for the libraries, um, we'll probably have you at the table when we design that training program as well. Okay, that and would be great. Yeah. yeah, and I, I didn't go over the, uh, the uh, calculator for self-sustainability because it is so straightforward. You basically, again, choose your county, look at what expenses you have, and it'll tell you how much you need to make. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, we did have a question from Caleb in Boyle County. Um, his question is, the local workforce development boards which operate on a regional level, do those boards aim for local county representation for their regions, uh, specifically Boyle County's Economic Development Partnership that has its own workforce development committee. If I were to touch base with them about the Workforce Innovation Board, what kind of and what kind of collaboration has already happened? Yeah, this so may a be couple a, of things. Yeah, a couple of things. So first okay. of all, um, Bluegrass. I think Boyle is in Bluegrass um, with the Bluegrass Workforce Board. So first of all, they have an employer uh, committee that works specifically business services work with employers. So that would be one area of collaboration. A second one is I know pre-COVID they were also sending in workforce advisors into some of the libraries. Um, so they would actually have a, a session set up in the library for uh, customers to come there and get services. So that would be another piece of collaboration. And then third, they actually send those workforce advisors out also from a youth capacity to the high schools. Um, so that's another piece of collaboration. So when you talk about collaboration, there's multiple facets that that could be happening. But I would still suggest, yes, please reach out to them if you need a link um, as to who to reach out, just email me. I'll be glad to, to do a virtual intro for you. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Um, and Caleb had to leave to uh, to fulfill a notary request, uh, so we will uh, make sure to get that answer to him. Um, Got it. And uh, let's see. I think that's the um, – I think there's no more questions right now. Okay. And I just have some concluding remarks, uh, but if you still have questions for Melissa, feel free to type them in. We've got another minute or two. Yes, I, I think the concept of think global, act local is really important. Um, and thank you so much, Melissa, for all of this uh, information that you shared. And it gives us a really good overview of how all of these very different entities work together for the workforce system in Kentucky. Um, so we really appreciate you being here with us and sharing all of that. Um, don't forget to sign up for KDLA listservs. We have several for different staffing groups. We are archiving this webinar within one week on our website. And we will also send out everybody who registered will get the link. We would also like to thank the Institute for Museum and Library Services, which is where we get our federal funding from, for making this webinar possible. Uh, you will be receiving a certificate of attendance uh, for this webinar within one week. It will be emailed to you. 
And last but not least, uh, please click on that SurveyMonkey link where it says, please complete KDLA survey for this training and give us some feedback for this webinar. We really appreciate that, and it helps us with our federal funding. Um, so if there's no questions, uh, which it doesn't look like there is, we will thank you again, Melissa, and um, we hope everybody has a great rest of your Monday. All right, goodbye.